Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever or whenever you are. Welcome to Room 1206, Mr. Swanson, Beckham County High School, Helm, Georgia. And I have for you an audio guide on the presidency of James Monroe. We are going to call him a president of two lines. So thank you all for navigating these audio guides. I know this is not our favorite way to learn. I certainly miss being in the room with you. I uh, have received some emails from you and I've answered the questions along the way. So, uh, you know, uh, if you're watching this in August of 2023, you know that I am in currently in the Republic of Georgia. You're in the state of Georgia. I'm in the Republic of Georgia doing Army National Guard training with our partner Nation Forces, our friends in Georgia. Yes, Georgia and Georgia is funny. Uh, and if you're watching this at any other time or if you have found yourself in the deep recesses of the Internet, really curious about the presidency of James Monroe, well, Thanks for tuning in, and I'm going to try to teach you something today. So my class, uh, working through your packet of notes, you have this page that is uh, going to be your due out for the presidency of James Monroe and a bit of a, two different uh, infographics, political cartoon and a map, kind of illustrate what he is known for. Uh, and what he is known for is being a president of two lines. You're going to leave this class remembering that he is responsible for two lines and certainly that is what I'm going to explain to you in the next few minutes. So let's go. I want to get you started thinking about this quote. What do you think this statement means? Good fences make good neighbors. Good fences make good neighbors. Now, I'm looking around the room here, pretending to look around the room here. I know that uh, a lot of y'all have land. Uh, a lot of y'all have uh, agriculture, you know, in your family. So you may have fences to separate livestock. You may have some fences to delineate your land from the neighbors. You know, what is his, what is yours, where is the line? Uh, even if you live in a neighborhood, you may have a privacy fence, just a simple privacy fence. Uh, you know, wooden slats, a little bit more than eye level. You may have a chain link fence. You may have an electric fence for the dogs, right? An invisible fence that you can't see, but the dog wears the collar and, you know, and it lets the dog know how far they can or can't go. So uh, just think to yourself, uh, maybe a fence story. Maybe you have a story where the neighbor's dog doesn't respect a fence line, comes into your uh, area, your property, and leaves a little gift. I'll just say it like that. Leaves a little gift in your yard. Uh, maybe you have an experience where the fence line broke for whatever reason and livestock, cattle, chickens, goats have uh, crossed paths. So uh, I bet you have, you're thinking about something where your family or you have experienced uh, positive or negative with a fence. And the statement here is that good fences make good neighbors. Do you agree or disagree? I'll just give you a second to reflect on that. Yes, that was just a second to reflect on that. So keep that in mind. As you know, anytime I do a warm up, I'm going to readdress the uh, topic uh, throughout the class, later in the class as well. So keep that in mind. Your good fences make good neighbors. I want to re review just briefly because you can't really talk about the start of James Monroe without remembering the end of the War of 1812. So yesterday's class and lesson took us through the War of 1812 and you got to remember the main causes of the war impressment and we've actually dealt with impressment several times already and this was one of the major causes of the war of 1812 british ships british the british naval ships uh stopping american ships and forcing american sailors into the british navy anger let's go to war to stand up for ourselves one of the major causes another major cause was that the British have still not left the forts in the Ohio River Valley. So one, they agreed to do so after the uh, at the tre uh, Treaty of Paris, 18, 1783. Let me say that again. They agreed to do it with the Treaty of Paris of 1783. That's what ended the American Revolution. And one of the agreements was that they would leave uh, Western frontier forts up to the border of the Mississippi River. Uh, and then another thing, uh, another time they agreed to do this, was when George Washington sent James Monroe over, excuse me, when George Washington sent John Jay over to negotiate what would be Jay's treaty, a generally weak treaty. The only thing that actually came out of it was the British agreeing to leave the Western frontier. And the one thing they agreed to for Jay's treaty, they have not. So this is just another cause. This is becoming now a, na a matter of national pride, especially since we purchased much of this territory from France. It is now ours via the Louisiana Purchase. 
uh, just a lot of issues with the British still homesteading or really having a military fort and presence uh, out in the West. Matter of national pride. Uh, something I hope you enjoyed yesterday was talking to these eight different Americans uh, and hearing their different perspectives for or against the War of 1812. Some of them were for the war because of their sons being impressed into service. Some of them were against the war because they wanted the British as the trade partner. Uh, anybody, uh, anybody know George Roberts in town, right? We have George Roberts or his son in school. So students usually get a kick out of chatting with George Roberts. Henry Clay, key figure, President Madison himself, Francis Scott Key, author of the defense of Fort McHenry, which will become the Star Spangled Banner. So. Uh, I know that CGI is, you know, not exactly a 4K HD cutting edge technology, but hopefully you enjoyed your conversations with these eight Americans. Uh, opponents to the war were generally Federalists who opposed the war. And uh, in the end, given that we did succeed in the war, a marginal success, but the British did leave, this really makes the, the Federalists end up on the wrong side of the conversation, and it makes them look very unpatriotic, right? If you If you advocate for no war, and then the war is successful, well, you look like a loser for not supporting the war. Exactly what happened to the Federalist Party. This is the unraveling, the undoing, the end of the Federalist Party. So maybe you've noticed that there are no Federalists on the ballot today. Obviously, our two major parties are Republicans and Democrats. Uh, so that's not to say, you know, parties rise and parties fall. This is the fall of the Federalist Party. A major supporter for the war was President Madison himself. And again, this is more yesterday's conversation, so hopefully you recall this. He boldly asks Congress for a declaration of war. And the reason that's so bold is because we were the teenager country declaring war on the world's superpower. So pretty brash of us, but it is certainly showing that we are standing up for ourselves. And Americans like that, right? We like our leaders to stand up for us. And that was a positive for James Madison. Effects of the war. This is super important. You just want to refresh. So there was a surge in American nationalism. We're going to call that a shared national identity. No longer are we from Massachusetts and Georgia and North Carolina and Virginia. We are Americans. Hey, yeah, you still have your state. Uh, you know, you, you still belong to a particular state. You know, if you're, if you're going to send mail to me, it's going to be in Georgia. But the attitude became that we beat the British. So there's a surge in national identity or national pride. Uh, some practical effects from the war is that we had to improve our industry and our farming. When we lost Britain as a trade partner, we could no longer import their textiles from their factories. We could no longer rely on them as a trade partner for, uh, for our crops. And believe it or not, a lot of times uh, colony, well, not word colonies, a lot of times states failed to do good trade between themselves. We, uh, we'd actually do international trade better than we would do intra-country trade. So we had to become more self-sufficient. We're going to declare war on a European power. We're going to lose them as a partner, a trade partner. We're going to have to grow up. We're going to have to go from being a teenager to being a young adult. And that's what the War of 1812 does for our country. Forced the country to improve its manufacturing and farming. Forced the country to grow up. And the analogy I continue to use is like a youth growing up from the teenage years, wayward, lost, wandering, maybe just graduated high school. What do I do next with my life into those young adult years? Now we can handle our own. We pay our own bills. We, uh, we, we pay our own rent. We have our own house. Uh, we have grown up a little bit. Uh, another effect from the war, and this is important, the American system uh, is is born of the War of 1812. And the American system, uh, the author of the American system is Henry Clay. So he is one of the figures you spoke with on that, uh, that digital interaction, the uh, web quest. Uh, Henry Clay's American system has three parts. So there's gonna be a tariff on non-American goods. And this is gonna be something that favors only the wealthy because the growers, they actually are hurt by this tariff because other countries respond with a similar tariff. So instead of making it better for buying American goods, it makes it harder to sell American goods, cotton, tobacco, indigo, uh, cash crops like that. Uh, we're going to recharter the National Bank, and this is important. It expired. No, I should say, let me take that back. It did not expire. We rechartered the National Bank, so we gave it a whole second term, uh, and this is going to be true until 
the days of Andrew Jackson. So I'm just going to leave a leave a little cliffhanger there. Andrew Jackson is going to uh, take on the National Bank because he hates it, uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. And then a variety of internal improvements, and that is code word. You can say infrastructure improvements or industrial improvements. Uh, internal improvements mean at this era, in this era, mean ways that connect our country better. So roads are going to connect us from state to state, are going to connect us to the new western lands that have just been purchased and are a little less developed. Uh, canals going to make trade easier uh, as well, going to connect us via water. And railroads, a very important uh, era where the rise of the railroad is going to be something that helps connect our country. So the American system it sounds pretty good. What, I wonder, could be a criticism of it? Well, criticism is going to be how much it costs. Many of these measures are expensive, uh, and they're also seen as benefiting only the wealthy. Not the agrarian man, not the common man, but it's a situation where the, the businessmen get richer, the rich get richer. Henry Clay was an elitist, was from money, was educated, uh, and it's a plan that benefits people like him. So uh, an outspoken critic of the American system is, you're probably not surprised if you've been paying attention, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jeff Jefferson, the anti-federalist, who, of course, his party becomes the Democratic Republicans. He is agrarian. He is an ag agriculturalist. He has always looked out for the common man. So it makes sense that he is an opponent to uh, something that benefits the wealthy. So he opposes the American system. Either way, it, it, what it does do is connect the country, uh, but at what cost? Kind of at the cost of, uh, the, of the average man, the common man. Uh, and then here we have the end of the war. So uh, that was a brief review on what was the War of 1812. We now have the end of the war. With the end of the war comes the end of the Federalist Party. So kind of already they were opponents of the war throughout it. And when we actually win the war, well, RIP to the Federalist Party because they, uh, they really can't muster any more candidates, right? Nobody wants to vote for a Federalist who was opposed to the war. Uh, it's kind of seen as being pro-British and, you know, we beat the British. So who wants to vote for a Federalist? RIP to the Federalist Party. It is dead. Uh, and really, that leaves just one political party. So this is going to be an era where there's only one political party. Uh, and elections are going to be complicated in that regard because it's the same political party running against itself. Uh, and obviously, whoever gets the most votes from, uh, from, from that, poll of, uh, that group of candidates is going to be the winner. So enter James Monroe. James Monroe is the fifth president of the United States, elected in the year 1816. Uh, at the end of the War of 1812, Madison sees us through the war and passes the mantle, passes the reins to the next, uh, the next Virginian, who is James Monroe. Uh, and he, uh, he gets to lead through a pretty positive era in American history. So a little bit of a background, a little bit of biography on James Monroe. Uh, and again, on your notes here, just write down his basic accomplishments. And then, of course, two of them are flushed out for you as well. Interesting thing about James Monroe, he is the third Virginian in a row to be the president, and actually the fourth out of the first five. So Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, all from the state of Virginia, Adams being the only one of the first five who wasn't. And third in a row, each of those three served two terms. That makes 24 straight years of a Virginian being president. So, you know, that's Virginia was very powerful uh, state uh, early on and down to the point of the uh, founding fathers being from many of them being from Virginia. James Monroe is a Revolutionary War veteran. He was actually very crucial as a young lieutenant at the Battle of Trenton. He crossed the Delaware with Washington on Christmas night. He uh, held a crucial intersection uh, in Trenton, New Jersey at the Battle of Trenton and his holding of that intersection from a military perspective was crucial to winning the Battle of Trenton. So uh, he was wounded at the Battle of Trenton, uh, but recovers from his wounds, of course. So the Revolutionary War veteran has always been a part of the revolutionary generation, uh, early government. Uh, he was a Secretary of War. He was a Secretary of State. And it's really just kind of seen like he is due to be president. He deserves to be the next president. He is the last of the founding fathers to be president. Uh, he's actually called the last of the tricorn hats. So that, you know, the triangular shaped hat, three points. Uh, he's the last of that older crowd 
uh, to become president. He was the last to wear knickers. You know, that's the pants that are all the way up to your knees with the long knee breeches and stockings. Um, so he's just kind of the last of an era, the last of a generation. He takes presidency or he takes the presidency in, in what is known as the era of good feelings. This period of politics where there's not division and there's not infighting. There's only one uh, there's only one party and everybody is for the candidate selected. So just a unique period of unity in the country. We've come through a lot. We've had battles. We've had division. So sometimes sometimes some presidents don't lead through a war. They don't lead through a conflict. And that's kind of what James Monroe gets to have. He is a president in an era of unity and an era of good feelings. If you Read the uh, read the the um, political cartoon here. You can see there's a banner era of good feelings, roads and canals, equal jobs. That person would be for the American system. I'm with Clay's system. Obviously, that person's for the American system. One party for one nation, right? No infighting. United we stand. Divided we lose to Britain. So let's stay united. Uh, and he said, "This is Monroe." He says, "United we prosper." The era of good feelings. Uh, Monroe does something at the very beginning of his presidency that hasn't been done since the days of Washington. He kicks off his presidency with a tour of the nation uh, in, by horse and carriage. So literally, uh, at the, that's pretty slow travels. And with those slow travels, he stopped in a lot of towns and he met a lot of people. Uh, the reason he did this is because the White House was actually still being rebuilt after the fire from the War of 1812. Uh, it was actually in 1814. So since the executive mansion, that's what it's known as, since the executive mansion was being rebuilt, Monroe goes on a tour of the country. He goes as far west as Detroit, Michigan. And now look at the map, Michigan. I mean, today that's not exactly a Western boundary, uh, but at the time that was kind of a, you know, a Western extent of the country, or at least for the pace of travel and the president's duties, mostly keeping him in uh, Washington City, Washington, D.C., that's pretty far west. Uh, and that's the farthest west that a president has gone since Washington. So uh, he got close to the people. He met them. They met him. They liked him. It was a huge success. His horse and carriage tour of the country was a huge success. Uh, the economy is booming. The American system and its projects are working. Now, you know, the criticism that they only benefited the wealthy, but canals and roads and railroads are connecting the country, uh, and Monroe just gets to preside over one of the happiest eras for any president to date. No great crisis, no great war, peace and prosperity. But the question to be answered, there's one division, one lingering question that's really always been there from the beginning, and it's kind of been avoided by all the other presidents, right? Almost like the Heisman Trophy thing, like shoving it on down the line. That's the issue of, of slavery. So Monroe is going to have to address the issue of slavery. And Washington and Jefferson, just a little bit of background of why it got pushed on down the line. Washington and Jefferson took the view that slavery was probably going to die on its own. Uh, Jefferson has the quote where he says, it's like holding a wolf by the ears. You can't let it go because it'll destroy you. And the idea was they didn't really want to have slavery, but they also didn't know how to undo the institution uh, of slavery. And actually, they believed that it was probably going to die on its own, and they really weren't too concerned with what the federal government should do about it. They actually believed the federal government had no control over it. They believed it was a state issue. And these early founding fathers, these first four presidents, they really expected it to be gone within a generation or two, that the problem would just disappear. I mean, and in a lot of way, in hindsight, we can see that their inaction allowed it to continue to grow. Um, and made it a central issue for much of early American history, a central issue and a complicated issue. Well, this changes in the year 1818 when Missouri petitions to become a member of the Union as a slave state. So yeah, Missouri petitions to become a, a member of the Union as a slave state, and the question becomes, how do we deal with states that were purchased in the Louisiana territory entering the union. This whole chunk of land that doubled our country's size when these individual territories have enough settlers to apply for statehood, when they apply for statehood, do they get to be free or do they get to be slaves? So this is where Madison Monroe is gonna be a president of two lines 
And line number one is going to come to us in the year 1820. Okay, line number one, 1820, it is the Missouri Compromise. Missouri applies to be a state in 1820. And at that time, there were 11 free and 11 slave states. So I'm a, this might be something where you want to look at the screen if you've only been listening to the audio. I'm a balance, 11 free and 11 slave. I'm perfectly balanced. If Missouri joins as a slave state, that tips the scales in the direction of slaveholding states. Missouri joins as a slave state. That means they get a con congressman representative who is pro-slavery, and they get two senators who is pro-slavery. Or if they join as a free state, same thing, right? Either way, whatever happens with Missouri, it's going to tip the balance, make it uneven. Admitting to Missouri would make it uneven either way. So one of the great values of America is compromise, right? Not all of one opinion and not all of the other opinion, but what is the middle ground? Well, we get ourselves the Missouri Compromise. As a compromise, we agree to let two states enter at the exact same time. Maine, the northernmost state to this day, enters as a free state. And Missouri, which is in the southern area and you know the southern economy and the plantation economy and southern soil all that missouri kind of a uh, precluded or predestined to be a slave state based off of its soil and its economy enters as a slave state let me say that more simply maine enters as a free state in the north missouri enters as a slave state in the south we have sectionalism we have division we have north and south we have free and slave all of those components at play in the Missouri Compromise. Temporarily, it seems that we have maintained balance, right? Let's just admit two states at the same time, 11 and 11 now becomes 12 and 12. You gain two senators from a free state and you gain two senators from a slave state. Temporarily, for now, the, uh, the, the status of the union uh, remains balanced. Here's a way for you to remember the Missouri Compromise, okay? Well, this is one of those ch little cheat sheets uh, that you should jot down. I was thinking about Eminem. Missouri Compromise, Missouri and Maine. Eminem, Missouri and Maine. Maine, Northern, Free State. Missouri, more Southern, admitted as a slave state. So Eminem, Missouri and Maine. There's a little cheat sheet for how to remember the Missouri Compromise. Well, the question now is, what about next time? Okay, okay, we admitted one and one, and now we have ourselves balanced out at 12 and 12. But are we going to keep admitting two states every time? What if the geography is different? What if two states petition to be uh, admitted at the same time, but they're both from either the north or the south? What about next time? What about next time? Can this compromise solve future disagreements as well? Yes, it can try at least, right? The Missouri Compromise. So in the future, the issue of slavery is determined, will be determined by a territory's location. This is where the line comes in. M M Monroe is a presidency of two lines. The 3630 line of latitude is, is used to determine a, a state's slavery status. North of that line, a territory will be admitted as a free state. South of that line, a territory will be admitted as a slave state. 3630, it's just a line on the globe, okay? It's not a river. It's not a mountain range. It's not physical geography, but the line of latitude, okay, that's the east running, east-west running line on a globe that goes around the globe. Just like the equator is zero, we'll come north and you have 3630. It's actually the southern border of Missouri. So this line is used to have a future plan on how to admit states. Missouri Compromise draws an east-west line through the Louisiana Purchase, and slavery is prohibited above the line and allowed below the line. The one exception is that Missouri itself is admitted as a slave state. So this map does a pretty good job, and this is on an infographic on your notes as well. The red line here is 3630. You can see it follows the curvature of the globe, right? It's not just straight across. It follows the curvature of the globe, uh, the line of latitude. It is the southern border of, Miss, of Missouri. So what you have above the line, you have Missouri are admitted as a slave state. Kentucky, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware already admitted as slave states. But the point of the line is to deal with 
future uh, admissions from the Louisiana Purchase. Now, problem, and <laughs> I wish they thought through this, if you look at the map, you can see that there's nothing from Louisiana south of the line. Texas was not a part of that. This area, this gray area that says Spanish rule, that was not a part of Louisiana Purchase. What was a part of Louisiana Purchase is the orange, uh, and most of it is north of the line. So I think they did themselves a disservice by drawing this line with all the unorganized territory being north of it, okay? This is, I, I, the, the analogy I like to use is it's just kicking the can on down the line, right? We're gonna make it someone else's problem later. We're pretending this is a compromise for now. It solves the problem today, but it doesn't really solve the problem into the future. But here you have it, this is the first line, drawing the line at 3630 and really just creating a problem for the future as well. This next map here, again, shows a little bit more of the 3630 line. Uh, Arkansas territory is south of that line. So uh, theoretically, Arkansas would be admitted as a slave state, but the preponderance, the majority of unorganized territory is north of the line. This was negotiated by Henry Clay. Uh, we've heard that name before. Henry Clay is called the Great Compromiser. And it's actually not even the last time we're gonna hear from Henry Clay. They are working on the test. Fire the test is attached. You can just disregard while it's going on. Thank you. I don't know if you heard that or not. There is a faint fire alarm going off in the background, and it is just a test. I have not had a perfect video yet because they keep messing with my uh, my background. All right, line number two. That, that was that was Missouri Compromise. That is line number one. Line number two is going to be the Monroe Doctrine. If you're president someday and you come up with some plan, you can use your name and slap the word doctrine onto it. And it sounds really official, right? So if you're president someday, maybe a Swanson doctrine or use your last name, right? Doctrine. Well, in this case, James Monroe is the president. So James Monroe comes up with the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine becomes a centerpiece of American foreign policy. It is a precedent, and it is a precedent that, quite frankly, brings us into the modern era as well. So we're, I'm going to teach it to you today. I'm going to introduce it to you today, and we are gonna, you're going to continue to hear about it into the modern era as well. So I wonder if he knew in 1823 that he was going to establish something that would last for literally 200 years. It's 2023, uh, but it does. James Monroe's doctrine and the precedent of it affects the world you live in. Today. So a little bit of a background for the political climate of the Americas, and I say that plural, okay, North and South America. Political climate of the Americas at this time is that several countries in Latin America had just recently won their own independence. The American Revolution inspired several other independence movements, uh, and Spain and Portugal and France uh, lost a lot of colonial holdings in the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, based on the revolutionary spirit, revolutionary attitude. So you got a lot of new countries and you can browse the map. You can kind of glean some of the details from that map right there. Viva la Liberty. Yes, we love Liberty. This is a picture that represents many different uh, freedom movements, revolutionary movements in the Latin, in, in the Latin America uh, nations. So this is the setup, okay? This is what's been happening in Central and South America. Uh, European monarchies are not amused by the fact that they have lost their colonial holdings. So some of these European monarchies, Britain, France, and others, they plan to help Spain and Portugal regain their colonies. So the picture I got here, you see uh, this, uh, the first guy has definitely got a German, Germanic uniform on, British uh, portly gentleman, and just several other representations of European attire. Uh, and they're looking across the ocean. And the other half of the picture, and it's, some of it's cut off, but it does say Monroe Doctrine. You can tell that they're looking across the ocean to their lost colonies. Well, U.S. leaders, James Monroe and Secretary of State is John Quincy Adams, U.S. leaders are fearing that this young American government, I mean, we're in our 30th year, okay? But for the, you know, in the grand scheme of being a, being a nation, we're still pretty young. Uh, we have our surge in national pride and we beat the British twice, but we're still pretty young. We have the fear that we might, our government might be in danger if the Europeans are allowed to come back over 
and recolonize, especially if they come with force, if they come with their military, if they retake some of their previously won, uh, previously lost colonies like Bolivia, I'll go back to this map right here. If they come back into Colombia and Peru and Cuba and Haiti and Brazil and uh, San Martin, et cetera, Chile, uh, if they come back to these lost colonies, well, what's going to keep them from just sliding back on up north and regaining what they lost in the, in, in, in the United States, right? So we have fears uh, that we might be in danger if this happens. Of note, okay, this is not something we're going to dive a lot into, but take it up north. Uh, Russia is colonizing in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and today, what is today is Alaska. So there's, a, there's the same fears to our north, and what if those Russians come through Canada and into our northern territory? So almost like being squeezed, right? If the Europeans come from the south and the Russians come from the north, we have concerns for our way of life. So here's line number two. Line number two is the Monroe Doctrine. In December of 1823, President Monroe issues the Monroe Doctrine. It was actually mostly written by his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. But John Quincy Adams was not the president, so he doesn't get to slap his name on it. That's why it's known as the Monroe Doctrine. Make this picture a little bit bigger here. We see Uncle Sam. Okay, and Uncle Sam is going to be very is iconic of the United States. U.S. Uncle Sam. U.S. United States. Uncle Sam has drawn a line in the sand that says Monroe Doctrine, right? In cursive script there. Can y'all read cursive? Is that a thing? It says Monroe Doctrine. Okay, Gen Z, I need you to be able to read cursive. And you can clearly see that the Germanic-looking individual and the British-looking individual are on the other side of the line. Uncle Sam is saying, I'm drawing a line between our two hemispheres. Don't cross it. So I'll use my uh, GIF here again. I'll use my moving image to draw the line. This is line number two, the Monroe Doctrine. Here's a clean definition for you, all right? So on your notes here, this is what you should write down. In a sentence, this is the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine is the policy that stated the U.S. would not seek additional land beyond our borders and that we will seek to prevent other nations from trying to acquire U.S. land or interfere with democracies in the Western Hemisphere. Simply put, and that's a good definition, write that down. Simply put, we are not trying to expand and we won't tolerate you coming into our, 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 our areas. We won't try to expand and we won't tolerate you trying to come back into our areas. We reserve the right to defend any democracy. You're a monarchy, okay? Monarchies are different than us. That's what y'all do in Europe. We do democracy in the Americas. So any interference with a democracy, even if it's not us, okay, but if you interfere with a neighboring democracy, we will defend it. So kind of a two-part statement. You stay there, we'll stay here. I'm drawing a line and you don't need to cross it. Uh, a little bit more detail here in these next two slides, flush out some of the actual components. I would suggest you don't need to write this down word for word, but it's good for you to know. First is that the American continents are not open for colonization. In fact, I'll say the opposite word. The American continents are closed for colonization by any European powers. Okay, We have independence, and you can't take us back to the way it used to be, closed for colonization. Two, nations in the Western Hemisphere, okay, that's America, nations in the Western Hemisphere are inherently different than those in Europe. We are democracies. You are monarchies. Hey, it works for you, the king-queen thing, parliament, oil. We are democracies, you are monarchies, we're different, and there's no trying to get back together. We are never, ever, ever, already sang that song with the Declaration of Independence. Three, the United States will regard it as a threat. Any attempt by a European power to impose their system of monarchy upon any independent state in the Western Hemisphere. Plain speak, if you come over here, we're going to consider it an act of war. And we therefore reserve the right to uh, defend ourselves or any other democracy in the Western Hemisphere. And four, component number four, this makes it, this makes it a, a fair trade. We will not interfere in European affairs. You don't come over here and bug us, and we're not going to bug you. Okay? So simply put, you stay over there with your monarchies. We'll stay over here with our democracies. And the Monroe Doctrine is the line in the middle 
uh, that neither of us needs to cross. So summary, we warned the European nations against reestablishing colonies in the Americas, why these actions would be considered dangerous to our peace and safety. That's the language actually used. And also we promised that we will stay out of European affairs. Great picture, great political cartoon, shows Uncle Sam in the Western Hemisphere. His star-spangled hat is protecting Latin and South America, and of course, America itself. And the European nations are on the other half of the world, the Eastern Hemisphere, and there is no reason for the two to ever cross. Simply put, okay, I built this slide myself. This is how I summarize it for you. You stay there, Europe. We'll stay over here. I've said that a couple times. You stay there, Europe. We'll stay here. What's between us? The entire Atlantic Ocean. That's the line. Now, 3630 was a line, right? I mean, a line of latitude. The Atlantic Ocean is huge, right? It's not your typical line. It's not like drawing a line with a pencil. It's a big, fat boundary that there should not be any mistake about crossing it. You stay over there. We'll stay right here. There's a big ocean between us. No reason to cross it. I'll put it on a map here. America, Europe, Atlantic Ocean, huge drink of water between us. Draw the line. Don't cross it. This is the Monroe Doctrine presidency of two lines sounds a whole lot like did someone did someone say it did you shout it out it'd be funny if y'all shouted it out at the same time while you have your headphones on sounds a whole lot like washington's farewell address doesn't it what did washington say in his farewell address he advocated for neutrality avoid foreign entanglements monroe's doctrine builds upon washington's precedent Monroe shows that he listened to the founding father, the father of our country, the first president, by adding to Washington's farewell address sentiment. Washington said it as a suggestion. Monroe codifies it as a doctrine. So the Monroe Doctrine and Washington's farewell address sentiment of neutrality, those are connected, right? We should, in this class, we, we wanna draw conclusions from multiple pieces of information we should make that conclusion uh, pretty plainly, right? Because we're good students of history. Uh, this shows that the US sees itself as a world power, okay? Beat the British once, beat the British twice, and now we're telling the Europeans to stay out of our Kool-Aid? Yeah, flex on them. We have arrived on the world stage. We are dictating foreign policy to European powers because we have the standing to do so. We are now not, we're not a juvenile country anymore. We're a young adult, and we have the strength in order to say this. We see ourselves as a world power. Final picture here, really illustrative. And, you know, if I was a guessing man, this could be something you see on the EOC. EOC loves political cartoons. I can't take a guess as to which one they'll choose, but we want to understand the components of a political cartoon. Uncle Sam standing in the Americas. His doctrine says hands off, and he's pointing towards Europe. Pretty plain to see that the ocean is between us. Uh, pretty good representation of the Monroe Doctrine. And I'll use the line one more time. Draw the line one more time. So uh, James Monroe, a presidency of two lines. Line number one, the Missouri Compromise, 3630. Settles the issue of slavery, at least temporarily, right? A balance of free and slave states. Uh, line number two, the Monroe Doctrine addresses uh, international relations, international affairs between the Americas and European monarchies. So summarizing that pretty plainly, let me uh, get back to how we started and ask you this question. What do you think uh, this statement means now? Good fences make good neighbors. At first, I was talking about the dog that got out of the yard and you know pooped in yours. That's not what I'm talking about anymore. I want you to think about our current relationship with Europe. I want you to think about our current relationship with England. Everything I've told you in the story of us so far, you might be like, you know, we're never gonna be friends with them, right? They, they held us down as colonies. They abused us with their soldiers and their taxes and their policies. We fought them a second time in the War of 1812. They wouldn't leave our frontier territories. How in the world are we friends with them today? I give you the fence line. Good fences make good neighbors. 
I believe that Monroe's doctrine was the fence needed in order to create a more positive relationship with Europe. We needed to draw the line, give ourselves a healthy distance to rebuild a positive relationship with Europe. And yes, we are friends with the British today. I've trained with the British Army, which is as ironic as it can get, given that they were our first enemy, right? So uh, good fences do make good neighbors. Now on your notes there, uh, write down what you think. So it says, what do you think this saying means now, considering the two, long, two lines drawn by James Monroe? So on your notes, I want your thoughts. Let me just take mine. I want your thoughts uh, about what the saying means in light of what I just taught you. So let's uh, conclude the new republic. We've walked through the first five presidents at this point. So the conclusion is that each founding father president, and when I say that, I mean the first five presidents, each founding father president established a lot of precedents or baselines that future presidents would follow. Every president has put his fingerprints on the office, but the first five, man, everything they did was foundational, was baseline, was precedent setting. So I hope you understand that word at this point because we've said it a lot. Uh, the first five presidents almost inherited the office based on what they did in revolutionary America. Uh, their role, uh, their service in, uh, in the military, okay, bearing arms in, in uh, support of uh, creating a new country, their role in creating a new constitution, their role in foreign affairs, and many of these uh, diplomats uh, had important roles with negotiating a variety of things between France and America, between Britain and America. So these first five presidents almost, almost were gifted the position based on their roles in revolution in America, but following presidents, following presidents outside of that founding generation, the sons of the founders and beyond, uh, they're going to have to earn it on their own. They're going to have to uh, campaign differently. They're going to have to attract voters differently. We're going to expand voting in a lot of ways. And uh, the leadership styles are going to be different uh, as well. So the story of us remains to be continued. And it is my pleasure, my joy, my privilege to tell it to you. So thank you for tuning in for this uh, installment of the American presidency, uh, James Monroe. The story of us, U.S., get it, remains to be continued. So my students in class, uh, there's a couple more hyperlinks for you to check out. There's a YouTube video on the Missouri Compromise. There is James Monroe in 60 seconds. If you haven't yet, Check out the GA, the Georgia Department of Education, the GSE EOC uh, video series uh, about the first five presidents. I've hyperlinked this for a couple days in a row now. So you got plenty, of do, plenty to do and also plenty of time to do it. If you've been absent, go backwards and catch up. If you're ahead of the game, you can push forward in the packet, read the next article uh, and plenty of other hyperlinks. Look it is a great way to review. And the story of us uh, episodes that I have posted as well are a way you can occupy your time. Plenty for you to do, plenty of time for you to do it. So as uh, Sayla often adds to my slides, usually the last slide, and she chose Hasta Luego Adios from Mirabel. So I will say Hasta Luego and Adios from Room 1206. Mr. Swanson, love you, mean it. Out here.